part of your face or welcome to your face. And I am also a uh, policy director for State Senate for Star Wars Rivera. And uh, I just got called into duty to moderate. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to our, our panelists. And uh, since we have probably about 40 minutes or so, maybe five or six, seven minutes, sorry, happening. from an organization called Make the Road New York. We have about um, 10,000 members throughout the city. Um, Bushwick, Brooklyn, Queens, Roosevelt, Jackson Heights, Queens, Port Richmond, Long Island, Staten Island, and, and Central Ice in Um And so this is definitely an issue that, that uh, we can't ignore. Many of the folks from our community um, know that Stop and Frisk, it's kind of um, an initiation process, especially for young men of color um, growing up in communities like Bushwick, uh, to be placed in cuffs at least once in your life, to be stopped for so many times a week. Uh, and so, you know, we, we definitely we talk about community issues, uh, public safety, uh, it's definitely one that needs to be tackled. Um, and it's very dynamic. Um, so, um, you know, we, um, we as an organization are part of a, a coalition of different, or, of different organizations, policy groups, community groups. Um, and the name just recently changed. So I just want to make it easy. Communities United for, for Police Reform. Um, and so there's several organizations and policy groups looking into um, possible legislation to address the issue. Um, community approaches to um, holding police accountable. The way that we do it on a, on a grassroots level is that we have cop watches um, throughout the community, uh, moderate, monitoring um, public safety, um, and also we have a base of community members that are helping, um, you know, working with um, legislators um, to create policy around this, around this issue. So that's My name is Udi Ofer. I'm the uh, advocacy director at the New York Civil Liberties Union, which is a New York affiliate of the ACLU. We have about 25,000 members here in New York City and about 48,000 statewide. And for us, this issue of stop and frisk is really discriminatory of uh, police practices by the NYPD. It is, is, is I think, fair to, to characterize as the most important issue that we're working on right now. And we're very excited to be working with Road New York and with council member Jumani Williams. And for folks who don't know him, he's really the leading voice um, in the New York City Council on this issue and has a very aggressive and progressive agenda um, in the works on this. And so you should be hearing a lot more from him. But you know, I think it's really important, especially since we're such a smaller group, I'd like to share some facts. Um, because you know, you can have policy debates around whether stop and frisk is smart law enforcement or bad law enforcement, and it falls under the whole regime of broken windows policing and what that means. But it's important 
there, there, there's certain factual uh, data that you cannot dispute. And even the NYPD cannot dispute. And it side, it, 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 it bolsters our argument as civil rights advocates, as civil liberties advocates, to paint a very disturbing picture of what is stop and frisk in New York City. So I'd like to just share with you some facts that I think are very important. And really build four arguments against stop and frisk. One is that it's ineffective, and I'll talk about that. Two is that it's discriminatory. Three, that it's unconstitutional. And four, that it's really counterproductive. So let me back up each one of those arguments um, with facts, which I think is really important for us advocates to be able to arm ourselves with these facts. First of all, everyone should know that the number of stop and frisk, if you don't know already, has just skyrocketed under the Bloomberg Kelly administration. In 2002, there were 97,000 stop and frisks in New York City. So, one year after Bloomberg took office. Can you repeat that number one more time? 97,000. By 2010, the last year that we have complete data, that number was 601,000. So that's an increase of 520% under the Bloomberg administration. Secondly, and this is to build the argument of the ineffectiveness of this policy, it is, it is just, it, is, it should be undisputed that stop and frisk is a terrible way to detect crime because it just does not do that, and there's, and, 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 and there's no argument against that, the fact that it doesn't detect crime. How do we know that? Year after year, about 90% of people who are stopped and frisked are then let go. Why are they let go? Because they haven't done anything wrong. So year after year, we have about 5.7% of stop and frisks lead to an arrest, about 6.5% lead to a summons. About 1.3% of all stop and frisks actually lead to a seizure of weapons. 1.3%. And remember, stop and frisks is mostly promulgated in the name of getting weapons off the street. Can you imagine any private corporation who had a success rate of 1.3% and yet we're just pouring more and more and more money to, to, to propagate this failed policy. And that 1.3% has been pretty consistent throughout the years as the number has increased. Secondly, discrimination. So there are some, and it's not just race discrimination, it's also age discrimination. And I think it's always very, very important that we talk about both of those together. So black New Yorkers consistently make up about 50% of people who are stop and frisk, despite making up about 26% of the population. And Latinos, Latino New Yorkers, consistently make up about 30% of people who are stopped and frisked. On the age, one out of five people who are stopped and frisked in New York City are 18 or younger. One out of five are 18 or younger. When you look at 21 and under, it's about 38%. In fact, when you look at, at the age range 14 to 24, those make up, that, that age range makes up about half of all stopped and frisked. So it gives you a sense of not, you know, who is being targeted by this discriminatory policy. Secondly, the unconstitutional. Right? You can't have a program that sweeps up so many people, has such a low hit rate, without, make, without knowing that it is clear that the vast majority of people should not have been stopped in prison in the first place. And, and, and this was really in violation of basic constitutional protections. But in addition to that, you know, advocates have always said that we believe that there's a quota system in place, which is what leads to this increase in stop and frisk, and that police officers, um, you know, police officers are also initiated into the NYPD by being thrown into, um, into low-income neighborhoods and told to, to engage in a certain amount of stop and frisk. We always spoke about this, but now we have data and we have proof of it. And there was a great expose last year in the Village Voice that everyone should read who's interested in this issue and they, that they got their hands on a set of tapes, recordings, from the 81st Precinct in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, that actually has recordings of sergeants directing police officers to engage in stop and frisk of just anyone that they see, regardless of whether they have reasonable suspicion of a crime or, pro or, 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 or probable cause. So for to give you one quote from the tapes, um, in an October 12th roll call, a sergeant tells her troops, 
Um, if you all do a canvas, try to get at least a couple of 250s. 250s are the forms that the cops have to fill out. And just put robbery down to say that we were out there. You stop someone, get a 250, go over, let them, let them all see you all doing something about it or whatever. In another um, quote, she says, um, anybody walking around, shake them up, stop them, 250 them, no matter what the explanation is. If they're walking around, it doesn't matter, just grab them. You know, these are recordings of sergeants that I think um, make a compelling argument. And then finally, about the counterproductive. You know, a stop and frisk is a humiliating experience. And it has a long-term impact on an individual's lives. And when you think about a stop and frisk, this is not a nice encounter in the sense of a police officer says, hello, sir, can I, you know, talk to you? In 24% of the time, in stop and frisk, there's force use. 24% of the time, this is according to the NYPD's own data, which probably means it's more than 24% of the time. So at a minimum, 24% of the time, force is used. Force could be anything from throwing someone down on the ground, or, or throwing them up against the wall, or, or handcuffing them, or using up a time. It could be many different things. I mean, 24% of, of the time, force is used. The hit rate on, on when you stop and frisk a black New Yorker, and when you stop and frisk a Latino New Yorker, is much lower than when you stop and frisk a white New Yorker. So in other words, when you stop and frisk a white New Yorker, there's a higher likelihood that you'll actually seize a weapon or give a summons or conduct an arrest. Yet, the use of force against black New Yorkers and Latino New Yorkers is much higher. Which again, builds both the counterproductive and the, and the uh, discriminatory practice. But also, when you talk about police community relations, I mean, just like any, anyone who's working on um, you know, trying to make our city safer, I cannot think of a more counterproductive program. I cannot think of a better way to alienate you know, residents of New York um, than in engaging in this massive program. So that paints a picture. There's a lot more data out there, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. We have, um, or more time, we have a very aggressive legislative agenda that I'll be more than happy to talk about. It's basically, you know, we want to improve the profiling law in New York City and actually make profiling really illegal in New York City to, so, so we're able to stop the discriminatory practice. We also want to, you know, change um, you know, the basic police-civilian interactions to make sure that there are greater protections for individual New Yorkers when they come in contact with a police officer. And we want to create greater oversight and accountability. And Jumani is our main sponsor in, 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 in the City Council on these issues. With that, Councilman? Well, what do you kind of just did the whole panel with? <laughs> uh, well, my name is uh, Jumani Williams, uh, Councilman of the Brooklyn. I don't know whose camera is, but that's a great camera setup. I've never seen that. Uh, but um, I represent um, 45th District in Brooklyn, New York, which is these flappish, flappish parts of Midway and Canarsie. I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to say or not say, but obviously, uh, stop, stop and frisk is a huge problem. I think um, Uli said uh, a good portion of, of why it is, and it's great to have um, data backed up. But another component is um, it's both, it's bad on both sides, because many police officers don't like to stop and frisk. I think it demoralizes police officers who actually want to do the job. So if you have a police force that's demoralized by these stupid folks, and then you have a community that's upset with the police uh, who feel that they're kind of invading territory, that is a, a recipe for that. Um, Michael Bloomberg and Commissioner Kelly have just done a poor job when it comes to dealing with communities of more color in the city and refuse to even recognize that, that there's a problem. So that's a huge issue for me. Uh, Way. I live in New York City. Most of you know I had to deal with my own issue on uh, Labor Day. Um, this wasn't the first time I had to deal with that issue. I'm 35, I grew up black and broken, so um, you know, I've been six foot for a for a long time, so uh, it hasn't always been pleasant. But there's also been a lot of good uh, police officers I've gone to, and I've always tried to make sure we say that. That's not usually what the media picks up, but uh, I generally I try to say that. But it, it's, it's part of a, a larger problem, a larger culture uh, that's in the police department that needs to be rooted out. Uh, but we can't even get there until there's a non federal problem. problem. If you have these numbers, and it's still, I mean, I had the commissioner tell me at a hearing that they don't stop people on the basis of race. Um, 
it's just that I just you're just lying. That the, the data, everything shows that that's what you do. And then the excuse is, uh, when, well, we do what we do because most of the crime is committed in those communities, which is uh, most of the violent crime, which is backed by statistics. Uh, but before I get that, you can't have it both ways. You keep, you're either doing it or you're not doing it. You can't say that you're not stopping people on the basis of and then say you're stopping them because uh, most of the crime is there. So there are always a few issues with that. There is um, the high rates of violent crime there. Um, but we always, we always focus on the, the gun crime. We never focus on why the crime is happening to begin with, uh, which always frustrates me. We go straight to the, system, to the symptoms as opposed to the cause. But the fact of the matter is, the stop and haven't brought the shootings down. So shootings and shootings of more color are actually going up while the stop and frisk is going on. Programs like the gun buyback get way more guns off the street than stop and frisk. So it's, the way to, so I'm actually, stop, stop question of risk is a tool that I think the police department should have. Uh, it's just being abused in communities that look like mine and would never be tolerated you know, anywhere else. I mean, when they went into the Italian neighborhoods to split up the mob, they would have never used a tactic like this. Um, it wouldn't have been accepted, but for some reason it's acceptable in black, community, black and Latino communities when there's no base for it, there's no data that backs it up. Um, I think we mentioned it, but they, you know, when you stop black and Latinos and whites, it's, it's roughly the same arrest. I'm not to have the white guy said it was roughly the same, which says to me it's just a matter of how many people you stop, not the color of the person that you stop. Um, but they refuse uh, to accept <coughs> that they even acknowledge that. And then, I, you know, just on a grander scale, I, I ask, why don't we have a stop and peak program for people come out of Wall Street? Because if we had that, perhaps we could have stopped some of the global economic problems that we had. Um, and usually I get that laugh, and, and it's, it's funny, but I think, I, I think seriously, if we did, let's just stop people looking at briefcases. They're the reason that some of the lower level crimes that happened in the beginning. And, and I was told, um, you know, it's a federal problem. Uh, but so was terrorism, and we found a way to work with the federal government to make everybody safe for that and terrorism. So if we really thought that it was that important, we would have found a way to work with the federal government on the economic issues, but we don't. And I think with sales, uh, in communities to make so people feel they're safe is with crushing crime by being in the black and Latino community. What it seems to me is uh, what the NYPD is there is to make sure that the policies and the procedures that are keeping communities poor, the NYPD has to then come force them to be to maintain the system. Uh, and that's a really uh, disturbing thing. Uh, we have about 30 minutes, so let's just open it up. And please identify yourself and yeah. Uh, my name is Steve Coolidge. I work well with the Real Rent Camp Reform Campaign. But I, I'm a recently retired uh, city lawyer for New York. One of the, some of the cases I had involved defending police. Uh, one, one, I asked the panel to comment on this because I didn't have a good answer to him. I was representing a cop, black cop in the Bronx, who uh, on a motor vehicle accident, so it wasn't a uh, excessive force case. And I became friendly with him talking about these issues. And he said <coughs> he felt that they definitely was profiling, but he he said, think about this for a bit. Uh, if the very fact that some of the gangbangers, I guess, uh, know that they could be stopped uh, unfairly by the police, make some of them leave their guns at home. I, I didn't know how to answer it on that. I uh, yes. That's just not what happened. Okay. Um, um, the, the commission actually told Senator, State Senator Eric Adams that he wanted people to feel that whenever they came out of the house, they could be stopped. Uh, that was his goal. That's a tremendous thing to say. Uh, but people who commit these crimes, when they're doing it, they're not thinking about jail time, they're not thinking about anything else, they're thinking about whatever problem it is that they're having at that exact moment in time. So uh, I, 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 you know, from people that I know that deal with the you know, street life, no one has ever told me stop and frisk has made them uh, keep their guns home. People do what it is that they have to do, and they're quite efficient at it because the gun rate um, is going up at the, same, at the same time. And, I mean, the problem I have is that there's usually a hyper-focus on black and Latino communities. 
So if this was happening in other places, like if we had an Amber Alert or something like that, or something that quote unquote, you know, white crimes or, or mass murder or something like that, if we went into those communities and did the same thing, probably a different different conversation. But it only happens yeah, that's in you know black Latin community. Yeah, and I think there's a, just to answer this, I agree with everything Councilmember Williams said, and I'll also add the whole what's at stake argument. And this is really, you're talking about basic constitutional yeah. rights. I mean, in my mind, if the Tea Party was really, did really care about constitutional values, this would be the number one issue that they worked on. Because you have hundreds of thousands of people whose basic right to privacy is being violated on a daily basis. And the right to privacy is one of the most cherished rights that we have in the United States. The right to be free from government intrusion. Yet I think the public has become accustomed, wrongfully so, to be much more comfortable with violation of privacy rights in communities of color. And I agree 100% with Councilmember Williams. If we set up the same sort of aggressive practice on the Upper East Side, or in the West Village, not the Far West Village, but Greenwich Village. I'll use actually Greenwich Village as a good example. I guarantee you that we would have a much higher um, success rate in terms of finding marijuana on individuals. Good. If we stopped and frisked everyone walking around Washington Square Park, we would have a very high, much higher success rate in finding marijuana. And we're talking about personal possession of marijuana, which was decriminalized in New York State in the 1970s. Yet we're not doing that. Why are we not doing that? Because the public would never allow it to happen. And I really think that's what's, uh, actually I know that's what's happening in communities of color in New York City, many communities that uh, Councilmember Williams represents. And, and even if for sake of argument we would say, which I don't believe, it is an efficient use of money, which I don't believe it is, but even if that was true, it is still a massive violation of people's constitutional rights that we should find unacceptable. By the way, the stats, the stats, I know. Yeah, yeah, no. the stats show that people who use marijuana most in that age range are white men, not black and Latino, but they're just not, for whatever reason, stopped. Also, just to, um, you know, if you look at the stats, okay, so you go to our community, it's the obvious reality that, you know, grandmothers are scared to send their grandchild to the store, especially if he's a young, black Latino male under 25 because they might get wrapped into violence or they might be harassed and abused by police officers unlawfully arrested. And so that's the reality. We can talk about all these statistics um, and that prove our case right that it's not an effective policy, right? but the reality is there is violence. Like so there, there was a police officer who just got shot in the face in Cypress Hills on Tuesday. Um, and so the immediate community response is, so yo, Jesus, you're talking all that shit about stop and frisk. If that dude would stop and frisk, there wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be a gun on him, right? So the argument is simply, it's, it's pretty simple that it's a, it's a policy that doesn't work, right? Um, it's targeting our communities. Um, it's a waste of resources. Um, and, and also, we have to acknowledge the, the reality that you know, we, we, we talk about responding to instances, but we don't look at the, the root of the problem as to why why these things are happening. Um, we'll always go this way here and then we'll go here. Yes, ma'am. So, I'm happy I get to ask the question. Tell us who you are, please. I'm L. Joy Williams, uh, uh, political strategist um, here in New York City. Uh, I have a question in terms of. I'm New York one of and on New York one. <laughs> uh, I have a question in terms of uh, what the strategy will be, sort of maybe using the budget season when the department has to come before the council, and how, besides introducing legislation that may have helped curb some of this, sort of how the council can use um, the department coming before uh, the council in budget season to maybe address this issue, um, and, and how you can maybe do it on a legislative basis overall. Uh, well, you said a lot of things there. We have some legislation that's in, I've actually worked with uh, Make the Road and I can, to put some legislation in, try to see if we can attack it from a few different angles. A good amount of legislation is going to have to happen on the state level because they have jurisdiction. Right. Um, when, the, when the commissioner comes before us, there's no dearth of uh, politely asked questions uh, on the issue. 
um, and we dig in really, really deep. But the problem is the way the charter is written, we don't have the jurisdiction we would have over the police department or the budget. So the mayor has a very big hand on what happens in the budget process, uh, which is unfortunate. And actually, I'm working with um, Councilman Dan Garani, and we have a set of charter revision things that we want to put through uh, next year or 2013 that we're going to try to get all the mayor or candidates to sign on to. And a lot of it has to do with making the council have uh, some balance in the budget process, which we don't have now. Sometimes we're punks, sometimes the council, we just don't do what it is we're supposed to do. Uh, but a lot of times we can't because the final word of the budget, he tells us how much we have to spend, he tells us when, he can change it, so we'll tell us we have this much to spend, and then we fix it, and he says, actually, no, that was wrong, we have this much to slash it again. He does midterm budget mods without coming before us. And then if we pass our own budget, like we're doing Giuliani, he can just empower and say, I'm not spending any of the money. Um, so it's a real pain in the butt. But I think we need to be more aggressive, actually. Um, but there is, a, there is a pragmatic issue of not having what, what the power that we want. With that said, I mean, we, we all the time go into what, what has happened with this department. I think the biggest thing we have there is um, the bully put what we have and to try to um, bring to light what's happening with some sunshine. Um, it's hard to enforce, um, but that's why it is. We have found some creative legislation to try to finagle ourselves in there. Um, I'm sure that even if we get it passed, it's probably going to be a little cool But I, I believe in that group, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Did that answer the question? Can I make a comment about one of the funniest moments I ever had as, a, as an advocate in New York City working on these issues was this, at a hearing. When was the Kelly hearing? Like a month and a half ago? This was a hearing, New York one covered it, um, I think it was the manager, but um, um, it was a hearing that was supposed to be Kelly's victory lap. Because this was a hearing about 10 years after 9 11. Look at how great New York City is and we're all safe. So Commissioner Kelly testified before the city council, talked about all these amazing things, you know, they could shoot down airplanes and do all the stuff that they do. And then the moment that the questioning began from the city council members, it was almost entirely about, you know, basically bias-based policing, discriminatory policing in New York City. And that's when council member Williams asked about, you know, do you target like young black men? Um, asked about all these policies. And you can see that for Commissioner Kelly, he had never been put in such a position. Because he's a very, you know, he's a very honorable man in the sense of he like he has his ego, he likes for it to be stroked, and he doesn't like to be questioned publicly. And you can tell that he was visibly agitated. And I actually think that if there is a repeat of that on a, on a continuous basis, um, I actually do believe that he could have some real impact because this guy cares about his legacy. And this guy, you know, wants you know, he's, he's an older man, but, you know, so I don't know how many more years he has left, but he definitely wants, you know, in the public life, so he definitely is positioning himself in some higher office, whether it's on the federal level or here in New York City. And I think he's very uncomfortable in these sort of situations. And I do think that these sort of public encounters, for example, led Commissioner Kelly to issue an operations order, really recognizing that the stop and frisk and marijuana arrests were unconstitutional. Now, it's not having the impact that we were hoping it would have, but it was a recognition. So I think it's really, things are changing. Um, yes, um, my name is Nan Kirke, and I'm a legal aid criminal defense lawyer in Brooklyn. Before that, Steve was in the juvenile rights division in Manhattan, in, in Brooklyn, and I was in the juvenile rights division in Brooklyn. I've been a criminal for 20 years in JRE before that. The stop and frisk issue has been around for a long time, but Related practices that really started at some what felt like a fixed point in time later. I, I don't, I, you know, I can't reconstruct exactly when. One is the marijuana searches. Do you have anything in your pocket? Take it out and arresting for having it out in a public place. Uh, I can't remember when that started. But it started all of a sudden, and you started seeing it all over the place. Now I think that. Um, Perhaps a misimpression is, and of course it is an atrocious practice and it is supposed to change now and it's probably changing to some extent, but we have had cases since then that have come in. But I think there was a wrong impression given. Certainly it's an atrocious practice and some people's lives get hurt, but you shouldn't think that most people end up with a misdemeanor conviction on their first arrest and don't. Rare for somebody to get a misdemeanor conviction the first arrest, <coughs> probably their second arrest, on something like uh, marijuana under those circumstances. The other practice that seemed to start at um, a fixed point in time was the vertical patrols in housing, which are a form, a particular form of stop and frisk, and they, they were real rarities when they suspected somebody was buying drugs or something. And then they just 
I had of this was a kid. A kid was going to dinner with his aunt, and she wondered why he and his friends hadn't shown up for dinner, just like I arrested. Um, and I, I think for most of us in Brooklyn, this feels even worse than the street stops, because it's getting people in their homes or in their relatives' homes where they have a perfect right to be. And again, they were supposed to change their practices about it. There's probably been some net improvement, but not complete improvement. The other thing about that, maybe you read, you've got actual statistics on this. I don't, but it's, it's my impression that on the vertical control thing in housing, the, um, the arrest percentage for blacks is just overwhelming. That is to say, the percentage of blacks relative to Hispanics as well as whites is much higher on those stops than on street stops that are related to drugs or something like that. Um, again, I don't know it, just just my, my gut. Um, the I'm other thing that you all really ought to know just, about... We're, we're, we're kind of short on time, I know there's a couple Oh, well, I, I just want to tell people about activism okay, also. Well, um, you, you, yeah, you, you should be aware that there is now a movement against stop and frisk, and there have been demonstrations. I went to the fourth one, I guess, which was in Manhattan, and there are now weekly meetings for anyone who's interested in activism around this issue. You can call the name. I'm going to try to get the information. I want to quickly just say the human impact on stop and frisk. My, third, my cousin, walking down the staircase, lives in public housing, has an officer pull that gun out in his face. Guns were already drawn as they came up the staircases, issued him a summons for trespass in his own house. Um, the impact to a 13-year-old young person, you know, on, the, on a 13-year-old young person when that happens, you know, it's, it's pretty significant when, as you grow up, the interactions with the police are uh, likely not to be good. Um, and also, like, you know, it's, it's really hard to uh, convince somebody that they're, like, other community members that they're there to protect us. Um, or um, one of our members who, who was transgendered who got arrested uh, for prostitution simply because she was walking around while being transgender. Um, or someone um, in our community um, who was dressed nicely, and just because they were dressed nicely, that was the reason why they arrested him, um, saying that there's no way that you're dressed that nice unless you sold drugs. Um, so these deeds are day to day. We can, and and I think that um, it's extremely important to 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 think about the impact of of that when you step out your house. Um, now, now, I remember in the vertical, I think this Timothy Stansberry was the young man who was killed questionably on the vertical control. And, you know, it's a problem. My main problem is that NYPD's working in, in soccer kind of by itself. Now, if we want to, nobody in the black and Latino community, nobody wants that crime to go down than the black and Latino community. And we're the ones that are saying that this stop of risk is not working. It's, it's creating more of a problem. And then the, the mayor, uh, he's doing great stuff nationally, but he's taking two steps back locally because he continues to cut programs that would assist. So the programs and the policies that could fix a lot of these problems are not being addressed. They're being made worse. And then you're getting stop and frisk and police cultures that believe they can treat anybody that looks like me or like Jesus differently. It's a problem. It's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe. It's a, it's a powder keg that's waiting to be lit. Um, and, and it's going to happen. I mean, and just how you even speak to people. They, they pulled me over, and the police officer said, they just want to make sure I'm on the call. Um, you probably didn't have to say it then. I think I had a temporary tag and some issues, stuff like that. But they don't even feel many times they even have to address me in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner that's, that's respectful. I know they do that to white residents as well. Uh, you just have to imagine how much worse it is uh, if they do it to people that they call animals and stuff. Well, I, I also want to point out really quick in terms of race-based policing, if you look at the numbers um, and the data that's out there, you go to a, a culturally diverse area like 
um, Midtown, Times Square, the folks who are getting pulled over and stopped at first the most um, in culturally diverse areas are Blacks and Latinos. Or even even if you go to the Upper West Side, the folks that are getting stopped at first where there's barely any you know, people of color, um, like you would see that, that we get stopped at first a lot more. Um, what are you doing in that neighborhood? I can tell them. So no matter where you go in the city, there's a nice um, map that the Times put out. You can just, you know, you can play around with it and it'll show you different parts of the city and it'll let you know the numbers um, by race and also by age. And you'll just see that the numbers are, are there. So I, I see three hands here, so let's try to get all three. I'm Joyce Robbins. I teach sociology at Toro College. I'm also involved in some personal activism. I have a lot of questions limiting myself to one, which is the issue of ID. Black people believe that you have to carry from age 16 your ID, which as far as I knew was okay. It's not um, the law of the land. I was wondering if you recommend people not to carry IDs or what to say if they ask you for your ID. What's the story of your I don't know if it's the law of the land. I recommend people bring IDs. And what, when I was young, my mother gave me a book called The Little Black Book by Carol Taylor. Um, it's unfortunate that she had to do that uh, because your mom probably didn't have to keep that to uh, But uh, my mom had to give it to me, and I plan to do it to my kids. And I've always been taught you, you should be answering uh, things like uh, your name and address, things of that nature. I don't think the lawyers here, but I don't really don't necessarily have to answer much more than that. Um, but I always encourage people to respond favorably to the police or what it is they ask. What about actually physically carrying an ID? I, I never was told that I have to carry an ID. I never did have an ID. I didn't even I don't know, know if it's, it's, it's legally I supposed to be. I'm saying, but I'm saying for people who are, you know, for my students, for example. Yeah, right. Please carry ID. Right. That's what I think. Well, right. There's always, like, the law and the reality, yeah. right? And the reality is if you're, like, a young black man in New York City, the law is not that helpful when you're encountering a police officer with a gun. So you need to think about that. And we always try to talk about both in our Know Your Rights training. And we have a Know Your Rights guide that's back there that, that answers the question on the ID. Here's what the law says on ID, although the reality is very different. In the United States, you are not required to carry ID. That is one of the most cherished rights that we have. In the, unless, you're, when it comes to non-citizens, the law is different. So for citizens, you are not required to carry ID, period. Now, can the police question you, ask you for an ID? The police can always ask questions. There's this concept called the general right of inquiry. But, but you also have a right to remain silent, and you're not supposed to be punished for that right to remain silent. The only right, <laughs> that's the, what the reality keeps saying. The only time that the police can require you to show an idea that may be consequences is if they have reasonable suspicion of a crime. Then they could ask for it, and there may be consequences if you don't show it. But that's you're already getting to a high level of scrutiny that could even trigger us uh, an arrest. But in general, you do not have to carry an ID in the United States. That's the law. But I agree with Councilmember Williams that the reality is very different. I mean, they, they stop you. The, the basis of the stop, there has to be reasonable suspicion of crime. Right. Um, and if you don't have proof of identification, it could escalate when they take you to the precinct to identify you. You could be in jail for three days. Well, it's going to prolong your jail time. So if you get arrested and you refuse to show ID, they then, or even a summons, it could, it could, it could lead to an arrest when something would have been a summons. That the, the police officer can say, well, we need to verify their identity, and therefore we need to hold them until we can verify their identity, and that's when they'll fingerprint and wait for the DCJS to respond. So it'll prolong your arrest or arraignment time in general. So that's why we do recommend for people to carry ID, even though they're not required to carry ID. It happened just recently to a girl who was just wanted to, she was visiting New York and walked down to the West River and ended up in jail for three days right. because she didn't have an ID. Just like what right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Dan Winker. I'm just a concerned citizen, not a lawyer, or you know, work in the city. Uh, naive, potentially naive question of legalized on you. This probable cause idea. Uh, I'm, I'm naively shocked that this, this stop in the first is even a reality because if people can look at it and say it's unconstitutional, you know, and if it's if they don't, if they don't have probable cause, right? Because what's it really mean if you're like, well, we stopped.
stop that person because they were suspicious. What were they like? Did they have a bulge in their pocket that looked like a gun? Unless they're like the rare moments like that. What does that even mean? Right? They smell weed, maybe. You know, like there's a couple specifics, but in general, we're talking about 600,000 people. And, you know, so this is not, but like, can you, you know, can lawyers say that this is unconstitutional? If it is, then can we mobilize people and can we sort of not just city council wise, you know, not just coming before anyone? Well, you know, stop with fish is supposed to be certain levels. Like, it's supposed to, if it's really suspicion or whatever, it's supposed to, okay, you can ask some questions. And then if that question leads you to believe, that there's something else going on, then you can lead it up to maybe pat down or something like that. It's supposed to be steps. Of course, they don't usually follow that. But and I know we will we'll talk about the law, but one of the major problems is NYPD has no oversight. They don't report to anybody. They do whatever they want to do. The only person who can probably stop is the mayor. He doesn't give a crap. Um, and the problem is and they'll say that they report to a federal judge. Uh, but that's only in response to something. So there has to be a case brought in. But they do whatever it is that they want to do. City council doesn't have any oversight over them. Um, no one really does. And that's one of the major problems. But I know we can leave it I mean, I'm not a ticket. I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
respectable people. Do you get any recourse? There, so there's a federal, finally a federal judge has allowed one of the cases to stop the frisk uh, to go forward. So hopefully there's reason to believe um, something to do will come out of that because it's the first time. But you have to amass so much resources to take those courses of action when these guys who did a great job of keeping us safe for 10 years but won't spend any resources into fixing these problems. Like if they cure just a little bit, it can be fixed so much quicker. And to me, one of the major problems is to get them to recognize that there isn't even a problem. And I put the switch in my head when I became council member or when I was working in the community group. Because growing up, my view of the police was obviously much different um, just from the interaction with and that I experienced. So I try to view them as a, a community partner. And it gets harder and harder with these cases that come. It's harder for me to go to my community and say, we can trust the police department to be on our side. So I think hopefully people like me stepping out and saying that it's getting harder to do this. My colleagues saying it's getting harder to do this. And the, the, the stuff they're talking about building and moving and coming together. Hopefully we'll apply the pressure to these two guys um, who shouldn't be there as far as I'm concerned if they can't fix this problem, but to do it. Because the other way they're talking about we should do it, it's just a longer time and so much resources that can be spent doing that. And I think it's really important for us to, to really just, especially in our communities, just let folks know that it's not working. It's a, it's a policy that doesn't work. Uh, you know, folks are just like, you know, if, you, if I go to a, a senior center right now <coughs> in, during lunchtime and say, well, if you ain't doing nothing wrong, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Um, and, and that is pretty general, right? That's a general statement, right? But what I'm saying is, is, that, um, is that if we can make the argument that it's a policy that's not, that's not working, it's not efficient, it's not addressing the issue of violence in our community, which all those things are true, um, just as true as the reality of violence in our community, then we can start building from it, right? Um, because I know, I know, um, and then also what, what Jumani was saying is, um, Councilman Jumani was, was saying is, is that, um, you know, there's folks, you know, if we go in our neighborhood, many people who know an officer, many people who's related to an officer, and so anytime we criticize the way how you know the the, the institution is working, right, it can immediately it can be perceived as that type of thing. So really when we address the issue is that like, we don't want our family members to have to stop the first people for no reason. Um, and and they have to meet these quotas and work in a you know, we want a dignified workplace for officers too. Um, so, just, it's just like, it's, it's both, it's both, it's, it's two ways, right? We want safety in our community, but we want to stop the police, and, and we don't, we also don't want police, police officers to have to follow, you know, these unofficial quotas in our community, because it's not addressing the issue, and it actually doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and I think that that's, that's what we, I know, as make the road, our approach to, to dealing with the issue right now, uh, because if not, we can lose folks. We we'll lose people in our community. We won't, we won't really be able to get it done because it'll just, it'll just be perceived as anti-police. Um, and I think that those are that's like a good foundation to build on a lot of issues in our community around public safety, whether it be like starting a cop watch, um, monitoring police behavior in, in the community, or or um, having you know your rights bureaus um, in the community, or having you know design trainings for officers, um, whether you, that's culturally relevant. All of that can be built from that foundation. It's kind of a summing up question. Uh, you, talked about, oh, you talked about how Kelly cares about his reputation. He might be looking for higher office. Bloomberg has really tried to position himself as not discriminatory. He's spoken of uh, you know, and other things. Who do you think is a better target? And which of the two do you think would be more likely to Ultimately, um, you know, it's not going to happen in this situation. We're, we're all thinking about 2013. I mean, that's where the movement is. We all realize it's not going to happen with Bloomberg and Kelly. We're building the foundations for it, but it's going to, it's going to need to be a new commissioner or a new mayor. We need to make sure that this is a priority for them to fix this problem. It's going to be one they can't ignore. They're running for right. city wide office. And that's where the movement building comes in. We have to make sure that they do it. So, why? Just to last to pick up on some of the things you were saying. It's a false economy they always try to box people in. I can have a discussion and be 
equally as passionate about stopping the crime in my community and police accountability. So they always pretend like you're having one of those conversations you can't have the other. Both those should be happening at the same time. Um, it's probably going to have to happen with another mayor or another commissioner, but I am hopeful that it doesn't happen. So I'm hoping the movement can get strong enough to affect one of them. You know, the mayor, I think, is worried about the legacy also. Um, he's the only, the primary difference on this issue between him and Giuliani is better public relations. Um, other than that, the numbers are horrendous and worse. I think the more we can, it's very hard to embarrass, but I think the more that we can embarrass the fact to the point that he believes it will tarnish his overall reputation, maybe people start doing something. They're feeling that he, Commissioner Kelly, released an internal memo to the department saying if someone has leave and their pocket, they will be